Hello, everyone. Another excellent session just gone on universal healthcare. And it's great to hear from the young activists and organizations as well. Definitely, Degra. Uh, I think it's always important to think around how these high level commitments can really advance the health and well being of young people mm -hmm. and adolescents. The same for the sexuality education session. What always sticks out for me is the number of young people who are demanding information and knowledge about their health and their rights. And now for a session called Embracing Sexual and Gender Diversity in Sexual and Reproductive Health, LGBTQI plus adolescents and young people in the way. And another called Periods are Bloody Important, Learning from Menstrual Health Interventions. Both of these, as you'll see, lead into the core elements of sexuality education. Absolutely. And now we have a message from the amazing Eglantina Zing. Now, she is the founder of Go Leodorus. So her story is coming up. And there's also a short skit by a comedian who is huge in Nigeria and beyond. Now, her name is Tauma, and she made this ahead of the forum. Enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Eglantina Zing here and I'm super honored to be joining you today at the Global Forum for Adolescents. I want to share with you a little story. Perhaps it's something that inspires you, motivates you, or make you just as me, that I'm just a troublemaker, a trailblazer, a person that is super hard to make her sit down and just watch things happen. I will like change and I'm, I'm sure that we can all ask and our biggest mission in this life is to ask each other, how can we contribute to making this world a better place? So my story goes, I grew up in the Venezuelan Amazon and my father is an explorer. I have no tattoos, but a bunch of scars from a jaguar, a crocodile, piranhas. And yes, it sounds like a magic realism, but it was my reality. Uh, in my little camp, there was a soccer ball. My neighbors, were persons that did not speak my same language, were not dressed the same way, and we had very different traditions. But through that soccer ball, we forged these really strong bonds of friendship, of collaboration, and, uh, and solidarity, that until the day I took those with me. At a very young age, that soccer ball taught me that we have much more things in common than, we, than what divides us. So I went off years later to the United States and started a career in entertainment, in MTV, Project Runway, and a bunch of other shows that are music and fashion oriented. And yet I was still one of that generation of, well, because you were a woman, you will get to know. You cannot do that. No, you're a woman, you cannot play soccer. No, you're a woman, you cannot wear a short skirt. No, you're a woman, that's not your role. No, you just go play gymnastic, you just stay at home limiting us there are stereotypes and the societal rules that they don't define us but they do limit us and that's why since i cannot sit around and just watch things happen and comfort myself to the status quo i found the goleadoras foundation with its unique mission is to make this generation of girls the generation of yes that through sports a great catalyst to bring us together to forge character through discipline, through sorority and teamwork, this new generation, they will never get to hear a no because they're women or because they are girls. So I invite you all today and every day to join us at Goleadoras. And as we say there together, we change the game. It's about time. We're in this together. Happy International Girls Day. Young people from the marginalized groups and key populations are the most at risk of HIV infection. Now, imagine a world where no one is left beyond. Youth tests offer a unique solution to make that exact thing happen. J'avais peur de fréquenter des centres de santé de mon quartier, de peur de me faire juger au soir que mes résultats soient divulgués par des personnes qui ont de mauvaises intentions. Et là, par le biais d'un agent communautaire UTES, it m'a permis de connaître un centre de santé où j'avais la possibilité de me sentir à l'aise où je serais pas jugé. You test leverage mobile technology and artificial intelligence to mobilize young people through social media platforms, Facebook, 
WhatsApp and link them to geolocalized health services which are friendly to them. Let's support you to scale up now.女士们、先生们，大家晚上好！您现在收看的是凡恩·安南达首届国际交流线上论坛之青少年健康，很开心能够在我们的直播间与您相遇。不论您此时此刻在世界上的哪一个地方。of Youth Partnership for Peace and Development. I am serving as one of the mobilizers for the 1.8 billion young people for change campaign. I join hands with Global Forum for Adolescents in making the clarion call for government and partners to invest into the lives of young people. Hello everybody, how are you doing? My name is Mrs. Engineer Alaga Professor, Doctorate Afoka Duroke. Today, I am here to tell you something. First of all, I would like to thank everybody, hundreds and thousands of young people out there mobilizing to demand for better health and well-being from the hands of our world leaders. I say thank you very much for the work that you are doing. Now, it's remaining you. you yes, you, if you open your mouth and say something. It's you have come to tell now. You are sitting down there, your mates are there, mobilizing to demand for the time. What are you doing? Go now and go and register for the Global Forum for Adolescents. Follow 1.8 billion and register for it. Only food, the full or of You are not doing anything. What do you want to say? Will you go and register? <laughs>
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session Embarrassing Sexual and Gender Diversity in Sexual and Reproductive Health, specifically for LGBTIQA plus adolescents and youth. I'm Sari Imran. I'm a transgender activist. I'm working for the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights of Transgender and Other Sexual and Gender Minorities. And we will begin with the session with the introducing a story that includes, that revolves around queer activism in Africa by 28 African Human Rights Defender. Speak your love, Tanzania. At age 23, after a decade of calling to leave my best friend, I decided to tell him the truth. I couldn't let my love go unspoken anymore. In the middle of 2020, with much of the world still in COVID lockdown, we rented a house together in Dar es Salaam. We even shared a bed. He was always talking about his girlfriends, but I found him irresistible. As a Muslim, he was very religious, and I found it difficult to tell him how I felt. I thought he was bisexual, but I didn't want to ask. One evening, while we were lounging at home, I started a conversation about homosexuality. As soon as I mentioned the word, he sat up and said through clenched teeth, homosexuality is a sin. My heart was burning for him, but he was homophobic, so I suppressed my attraction. One morning, while alone, I wanted to send him a text message, telling him how I felt. Afternoon came, I didn't send it. Evening came, and I did nothing. Then a certain, sudden courage came over me. I texted him. Hey brother, I have been hiding this for a long time, but I think I'm bisexual and I really love you. I want you to be my boyfriend. I send it. My heart was pounding. Tolib came back that evening. I was so anxious. I watched him closely to see if he could reveal his feelings about my message, but he didn't show any emotion. He never texted me back. Silence sat between us that night. In the morning, I watched him grab his bags and walk away. I didn't see or hear from him the rest of that year. I felt so stupid for being rejected and ignored, but I missed him so much. My nights were sleepless. The time only made things worse. Even in my bouts of depression and suicidal thoughts, flashes of how I met Tolib entered my mind. I met him in early 2010 when I was at secondary school in Southern Highlands of Tanzania. In class one day, my eyes fell upon this tall, handsome guy. We connected instantly. Within a few weeks, we became best friends, but deep down, I knew what I wanted. I was so sad when he turned me down. I knew I couldn't continue wallowing in pain and sadness, so I got help. I reached out to Dr. B Michael Brady, a UK national medical advisor for LGBTQI health, who I met while president of my college's sexual health club and poured out my heart to him. I told him I felt worthless and undeserving of love. He sent me an affirming message. Innocent, you are valid the way you are. True love and true friends will always stay. Dr. Brady's message gave me hope. That hope yielded fruit a few months later when I met Melvin. At first, I was as self-conscious about telling him I found him attractive, worried I might be appropriate for our working relationship at the sexual health club. So I was pleasantly surprised when Melvin walked up to me one day with a big smile. If a man told you he finds you attractive and tries to seduce you, what will you do? He asked, grinning. What? I responded, not believing my ears. Melvin repeated the question. My smile grew even wider than his. I would appreciate the seduction and love. I if I found the person attractive, I would date him. Well, I find you very attractive, he laughed. I hope you feel the same way. Instantly, I wrapped my arms around him and confessed that I did. Melvin reassured me that there's no way to let love go unspoken. Our relationship inspired me to do something for other queer boys who feel rejected and unworthy, the way Twalib made me feel. I used my leadership skills to become a youth mentor and started traveling to Southern Tanzania to lead trainings at sexual health club events. In early 2021, I became program director at a youth-led organization that works to advance young people's sexual health and rights. I now use this platform to support LGBTQI rights. Through my advocacy work and personal experiences, I have learned that no matter the disappointments we face, hope will prevail. We must protect this hope and enjoy its fruits so we can inspire, inspire hope in others.
Hey, so hi, hi everyone. Um, gonna give a brief introduction on my uh, about me. I'm Rayan Rayan Monkey. I go by she, her, they pronouns. I'm a writer, content creator, and a diversity and inclusion specialist. I live here in Mumbai. I have a decade of experience in photography and filmmaking, and that's mainly where I want to be uh, focusing things right now. I was raised in a conservative Muslim family in Dubai, a place with almost zero queer representation whatsoever. And as such, it, I struggled with accepting my own transgender identity and accepting it. Uh, influenced by very misinformed, stereotypical, and often transphobic representation that I found in mainstream media. So today I kind of use all of these skills I have of photography, filmmaking, and as a diversity and inclusion specialist to try and create talk representation in film, uh, TV, and online that I didn't have growing up. And I'm gonna uh, pass it to Sarah to give an introduction on herself and then take it forward. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so basically, like, uh, my I'm also like coming from a conservative family and like uh, uh, dealing with the gender identity and expression component. It was all, of course, very tough. And uh, uh, we this session is we have a couple of uh, uh, speakers as well as to listen from them with different aspects of LGBTIQ adolescents' health and well-being. So moving toward first, we have. Melina, she pronounced as she and her. She's a social justice activist, chair of the Youth Leadership Council at the Global Fund for Children, as well as chancellor scholar at Vanderbilt University. Um, so welcome, Melina. And meanwhile, we are we'll be opening up a quiz poll to for the audience to fill it up. So hey, why is the... Oh, yes. Um, Welcome, yeah, Melina. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here at the Global Forum for Adolescents. Uh, just like Saro mentioned, um, I am a, a human rights activist. I was born and raised in Moldova. I'm currently in the United States pursuing a bachelor's degree at Vanderbilt University. But... Um, I am still, I think, very connected to my home country and the region that I come from, Eastern Europe, and I will be talking today about that as well and um, sort of covering the views of Eastern European society on LGBTQIA individuals and the challenges that arise from those very problematic and unwelcoming views. Um, I have about, I think, three years of experience, the fourth year right now, actually, of experience with activism. Um, it started when I was 16 years old and I, I founded Feminism Ede, which is my country's first youth-led feminist organization. We've done a lot of uh, interesting work so far. We've reached about 2,000 young people directly through programming related to sexual and reproductive health and feminism. We've created different resources and hosted conferences. And uh, yeah, as, as Sarah mentioned as well, I'm, I'm a, a board member at the Global Fund for Children and chair of the Youth Leadership Council at the Global Fund for Children. I'm also a member of the Global Advisory Group for the uh, HR 75 initiative at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and uh, uh, Women Against Violence Europe Ambassador. So I'm really excited to sort of be bringing that experience today um, into the session. Thank you so much for the brief introduction. Melina, I have a question for you. What are the biggest challenges facing the mental health and emotional well-being of LGBTIQ adolescent and youth today in your perspective? Yeah, so um, as, as I mentioned, I, um, I was born and raised in Moldova, and I think Moldova is very similar to, um, in, in terms of like the challenges faced by LGBTQI individuals, it's quite similar to Eastern Europe. So I would like to bring in 
that region um, and the Eastern European context, context uh -huh. into conversation. And um, across the region, there's a very frightening rise in depression and in mental illness among LGBTQIA individuals and children and youth that are part of this community are um, really the most at risk. And the challenges are really varied from physical attacks to online harassment to the fact that uh, there are a lot of legislative setbacks and um, hatred and disinformation, both um, in society and, and also online. So the culture generally in Eastern Europe is very conservative. It's very heteronormative. And uh, the sort of binary views of gender and sexuality are very deeply entrenched into the Eastern European society. And um, there is unfortunately a very um, big movement from the far right groups that leveraged the notion of, of family values and traditional gender norms and the excuse of protecting children um, to try and portray the movement for equal rights as a danger to society and try to paint LGBTQIA individuals as mentally ill. And uh, if we could get the next slide up. Yeah, so as we can see, these are just some examples of, um, of the countries in Eastern Europe, but um, yes, we can see here, um, above 50% of the general population of Albania, Macedonia, believe that homosexuality is a sickness or it, it is imposed by the West. And that's a narrative that is very heavily and widely used throughout the region that um, actually LGBTQIA people in the country don't exist, but it's the West that is trying to push the this like homosexuality onto people who would otherwise be straight, which is obviously absurd and, and not true at all um, because LGBT people have always been in the region. And uh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, did you wanna? You know, carry on. Oh, of course, thank you. Um, yeah, and Moldova, the country we were from, it's it's one of the most homophobic countries in Europe. So two thirds of, of Moldovan society, according to the, the latest and biggest study that was um, made by um, the NGO that we have that is, because there is only one NGO that is focusing specifically on like LGBTQIA rights. Um, two thirds of Moldovan society believe that LGBT people do not belong in the country. They should be kicked out of the country. And only 1%, and that is a very scary statistic, only 1% would be ready to accept an LGBTQ person as a family member. So there is a very, very high intolerance towards LGBT individuals, unfortunately. And this, these negative attitudes in society that are really everywhere in schools and media and, and in the family combined with the lack of access to sexual and reproductive health and to mental health services, they have really immeasurable negative consequences for LGBTQI children and, and young people. So these young people often find themselves in a very difficult situation where they face a lot of prejudice and discrimination and all this in the years where they're searching for their identity and um, they're really becoming adults and um, individuals. And so the lack of acceptance in their communities really takes a very severe toll on their mental health. Um, so that is why LGBTQIA youth across the world, but also in the region face very high rates of dis depression, disproportionately high rates uh, of suicide. They feel isolated, rejected, unsupported. Um, and this emotional burden that um, they carry often results in longer term issues like self-esteem issues or resorting to self-harm behaviors or um, substance abuse as they are sort of trying to cope with um, the stressors and these challenges. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, there's a legislative setback as well, which is that there's a an increase right now in um, so political parties and different actors trying to um, go against LGBT human rights. Um, and, and those rights are very, very scarce in the first place because um, many 
Eastern European countries, Moldova as well, like Moldova, Ukraine, Romania, just off the top of my head, they're neighboring countries of where I'm from. There are no equal rights. So same-sex marriage is not legalized. Adoption for LGBT couples um, is not legalized. And there's no, almost no protection for LGBTQIA young people and LGBTQIA community in general. And even if those rights exist of supposedly the country should ensure non-discrimination, they're really not respected. And this, we could see that in other countries too, um, the sort of rise of anti-rights movement, uh, which is the LGBT free zones in Poland, as they call them, the bans on sexual and reproductive health information in Hungary. Um, yeah. So these are just some, some of these. Thank you so much. Well, you know, for the very uh, detailed uh, answer. Just quickly, a second question, if you can just tell us, can you, three ways in which digital technologies, the internet and the social media platforms could uh, provide access to essential mental health care and provide emotional support to LGBTIQ adolescent and youth? Three um, ways. Yeah, of maybe. course. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of people talk about the, the negative impacts of social media, and I, I know that there's some truth to that, but I think for LGBTQIA youth especially, social media um, and, and digital technology, including social media, can be very helpful. Um, one of these ways is that through digital technology, through access to the internet, LGBTQI people um, and young people gain access to a lot of informational resources. So it makes it easier for them to explore their identities um, in um, a more safe environment. Uh, another way is that they find, they go to the internet and, and social media as a place to connect with other LGBTQI individuals or with allies of the community. And they find this like safe haven on online platforms. And that's particularly important in countries that are really aggressively targeting and criminalizing um, LGBTQI identities. Um, I know that studies have also found that um, many LGBTQIA youth perceive their online friendships as more supportive than their in-person friends and, and families. So um, that's um, really, that shows just how important it is, um, digital technologies as a way to sort of cope and a, a positive way to cope with these uh, various challenges that I've talked about earlier. And um, also a uh, third one is that um, through social media and just integrating LGBTQ culture um, in the online presence, we're really it really helps to dispel stereotypes and stigma around LGBTQIA individuals. And uh, it can also be used very effectively to raise awareness about the problems that uh, the LGBTQI community faces, what it is that they're fighting for, and dispel again those narratives that a lot of far right groups are trying to build that the LGBTQI community wants to corrupt people and wants to turn people um, into um, just essentially is that that is the narrative that's being used that the LGBTQI people are trying to turn other people gay, which is again very um, absurd. So by really using social media as a tool for change and talking about what are the actual problems and what are the concrete steps um, of what the community wants that really helps um, mobilize um, their peers to sort of lead that critical social change. Yeah, thank you so much. Like for really like social media can be a platform to uh, help raise awareness and the things. And um, next, we will move to Ryan. Take over for the next speaker. Hi, hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Malena. That was really insightful. Um, so I'm just going to tell you all really quickly uh, what the topic is that we are talking on and then move into introducing who our speaker is and hand it over to them. So the, the topic is identifying family planning and reproductive health needs of LGBTQI youth by including them in sexual and reproductive health and rights and SBC programs. And our speaker is Kevin. 
um, who's also known as Kevin Squash. And they are 25 year old identifying, queer identifying person who goes by he, him pronouns. So Kevin is passionate about working with LGBTQIA youth in his country, located within the continent of Africa with a special focus on issues related to sexual and reproductive health and mental health. In the year 2022, Kevin was among 15 young and alive, uh, young and alive follow, fellows where he received sexual health leadership training in three tracks of service, of service delivery, advocacy, and social entre entrepreneurship. After the fellowship, Kevin has reached more than 200 youth with information on issues related to LGBTQIA plus issues, rights, uh, issues related to LGBTQIA plus rights, sexual health and mental health support. He was among youth speakers in the first local youth summit on health and development, where he addressed mental health needs of LGBTQI youth in his country. Thank you so much for joining us and Kevin handing it to you. Um, just Thank to, you. Yeah, just to uh, drive uh, the discussion, we have a question for you. So the first one is, do you think uh, FPRH needs of LGBTQI plus youth have been addressed in FP programs? Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so if I was asked today if uh, the LGBTQI youth needs have been addressed in my country in family planning and reproductive health uh, programs, well, the answer is no. And that's strongly because, first of all, um, the LGBTQI community is strictly not, ac not, not recognized in my country. And um, with my understanding, uh, it's really impossible to identify or to be able to brainstorm solutions on something that is not recognized, something that um, it is considered um, a foreign trained. And if, if it's more, it's criminalized and it is punishable by law. So that makes it even impossible to even try um, to find uh, solutions. And um, another, another strong point I would say is the fact that uh, the LGBTQI uh, is, is still a foreign subject in my community. And it's su surprisingly enough, it's not even for the heterosexuals, um, even for people in the community. Uh, there is a huge... Um, there is a huge rate of misinformation. There's scarcity of uh, education and the right information, primarily regarding sexuality. And um, that really makes it challenging, really challenging because um, you have people who are in the community, they do not know how to identify themselves. They do not know how to term themselves or how to term how they feel mm -hmm. or like uh, how their body responds. So this makes this uh, a challenge. I feel like uh, localization of the subject is uh, imperative and it's paramount, let's say, if we want to address issues of the people in the community um, in family planning and reproductive health. Um, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, well, uh, last year I had an amazing opportunity uh, to be one of the Young and Alive uh, Fellows. So Young and Alive Fellowship um, is a leadership program funded by the Amplify Change and implemented by Young and Alive in the country. Uh, the program aimed at building the capacity of young people in the country to become active advocates of um, adolescents and youth and, and young people's sexual and reproductive health and rights, including family planning. Uh, so the fellowship covered three uh, leadership tracks, which are service delivery, advocacy, and social entrepreneurship. Actually, this was my first, I was 24 23 to 24, and this was my first ever program that incorporated people in the community in uh, subjects of reproductive health and uh, family planning. And you can see uh, how alarming this issue is in my country. And uh, um, I experienced, uh, there, there are so many amazing things I experienced, uh, but uh, in highlights, first of all, for the, I would say for the first time ever, uh, I was 
at an environment where I, expl I, I experienced a full inclusion and balance within the LGBTQI community in enlightenment of the fact that the LGBTQI community is not homogeneous. So uh, people were identified according to how they identify, they're identifying themselves within the communities. There were uh, lesbians, there were um, uh, asexuals, there were gay, like uh, the whole spectrum. So this was an amazing um, opportunity. And also um, the platform, uh, the platform gave the stage uh, like the program gave platform to the people in the community to speak on their issues as opposed to have other people speaking for them, which is really, really common um, to help heteronormative countries like uh, my country. So the people in the communities, we were able to vocalize uh, our issues concerning um, family planning and access to health services in general and brainstorming uh, practical steps into achieving the family planning and reproductive health awareness goal. And uh, last but not least, I experienced a great deal of compassion, empathy, and confidentiality. I know this can sound like, oh, oh but these things are actually like, I don't know, what is the most I don't know how to compare it. Maybe um, what is the most valuable thing that you can think of? Well, here in my country, confidentiality, it's its its really, really, um, you don't find it. Okay, you might go to the hospital, you are uh, wanting a service, a professional service, and the next thing you, you know, the whole hospital have their own. Your information, the nurses are frowning upon you, you know, so it's really uncomfortable. And that's why it's been hard even for people to go out and seek professional help because of the stigma and discrimination and segregation and because of bullying actually. Uh, so yeah, um, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, so the following are briefly uh, my recommendations. And um, first one would be uh, to, uh, to integrate mental health programs um, with family planning and reproductive health programs focused on youth. Um, because uh, people come to these programs, but most people in the community come with unhealed traumas. So I prefer that we should provide mental health intervention even before reaching the family planning and reproductive health um, programs or stage, because I believe that uh, mental capacity and mental well-being is really foundational when it comes to someone's well-being and reasoning um, in general. Um, and also to involve LGBTQI in leadership programs, hence uh, the Young and Alive uh, program. Um, in things involving our community, people in the community, we were able to take the stage and to, to lead um, on identifying and vocalizing our issues. Um, also involving or uh, partner with youth of different LGBTQI identities to understand their family planning and reproductive health needs and experiences and integrate these into family planning and reproductive health um, social behavioral change uh, programs. So uh, there is, uh, as I said, uh, there's a huge, there's a scarcity of uh, education and the right information. And in my country, in my community, um, the only people that are considered are gays, meaning that uh, male, gay males, the, the, the males who practice same-sex uh, uh, intercourse. Um, they do not know that it's a whole spectrum. There are people who identify differently within the communities. So I suggest that we get to balance and to uh, include everyone according to their needs within the community. And also uh, leverage insight and guidelines to integrate needs of uh, LGBTQI youth uh, in family planning and reproductive health. Um, social behavioral change programs, uh, documents forthcoming through... Uh, breakthrough uh, through uh breakthrough action uh, project so uh kevin um how you sorry just to so that we have time for the last uh session also but thank you so much that was really insightful um did you have anything you. more you think that was key that you would like to add you still have some time and then we can pass it to sarah Oh, okay. Uh, just, just to finalize, uh, many thanks for these few minutes of listening to me. Uh, please take the recommendations with you. 
uh, in making the necessary actions. This is my first international engagement as a youth speaker. I would prefer to travel and talk to you all in person sometimes. Uh, please invite me and always happy to share insights around uh, the area, uh, family planning, reproductive health, mental health, and human rights from my own lived experiences. My contacts can be shared by the organizers of the sessions. Lastly, many thanks to the organizers and I'm taking the mic back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that was really insightful. And also just uh, to say that there was so much from your uh, what you shared with us that I could relate to even here. So, Sarah, if you want to take us in with the next uh, speaker. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, we have our next speaker, John Daniel. Um, he pronounced he and him and uh, he's a law student as well as member of Pro Formelia Youth Network. So welcome, John Daniel, and if you can like give you a brief introduction. Well, uh, greetings to everybody that follow us. Uh, great uh, embrace from the Colombian fa uh, family. It was a pleasure to be invited. the youth network. Well, since in 1965, uh, Pro Familia Colombia, that is leader in terms of public policies, scientific innovation, and materials for uh, sexual and reproductive uh, health in, in our country. Among the strategies, we have this uh, the Pro Family Agent that uh, is a protagonist in promoting public policies and the constitutional agenda of our country. In 1990, the national program for the youth was created and with that, a sexual health program. From then, it, it emerges a strategy for uh, youth empowerment. In Pro Familia, we recognize the violences that exist for different reasons, for being a woman or, or having more difficulty to access health services or because we are LGBTQA plus people. And there we find common points to work, push and lead in our territories. And this is the strategy that worked for us in uh, Pro Familia uh, Youth. Uh, seeking for changes in our territories to cover the whole country and also impacts the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean because we have high, high taxes, uh, high rates of violence against LGBTQAA plus people. And the best way is talk directly to people. We have a strategy uh, to go to uh, educational institutions, talking to youth, uh, inviting them to be a part and especially informing their sexual and reproductive rights. We also have a strategy that is focused in, in preventing uh, child abuse and child violence because families should uh, protect uh, and empower children and adolescents. Next question for you, like what have been the advantage, advances and challenges in Latin America in terms of sexual and reproductive rights specifically for the LGBTQ community? Well, it is a full, fully diverse region. There are many manifestations of diversity in our uh, culture, traditions, uh, but we are a very diverse society on one hand, 
but extremely violent on the other hand, especially against LGBTQA+. Uh, Colombia is considered an advanced country. Uh, not a long ago, we are, we are considered criminals and uh, persecuted for being LGBTQ. And this, uh, because we, we, it is said, we, you have to behave as a man or you have to behave as a woman, then they are uh, sent to a psychologist or to a religious center to be corrected in between quotes, because we are LGBTQ. This is the so-called conversion therapy. We are also exposed to chronic physical uh, violence, family exclusion, loss of jobs, lack of access to education. Uh, this means not being able to exert our human rights and sexual reproductive uh, rights are related to sexuality. So we have uh, suffer violence to be, uh, if we suffer violence to be LGBTQA+, we are suffering uh, violence to human rights. Uh, there's a question, who is more than 35 years year old? But if we have and we are trans, probably we were not here because uh, trans people usually die before 35. So life expectation for these people in Latin America and the Caribbean is 35 years of age. They don't go, they don't get into the adulthood. So youth should take part in this change with strategies, with Pro Familia, we are achieving this change in, by implementing this network to empower youth and make them stakeholders in each of our countries, as in Pro Familia Colombia. And these proposals have to be uh, promoted and supported by all national governments and, and uh, local governments and international community. Thank you so much for your valuable insight and reflection on the barriers that LGBTQ adolescent and youth encounter in accessing sexual reproductive health and rights. And we will move forward towards uh, Ryan for the key messages and takeaways and call to action. So, yeah. Um, so from everybody's uh, speak, from whatever everybody had shared, there were some things that I could relate to very heavily, and I thought that maybe I'll just speak about those. One of this thing that uh, Juan just now said, which is about trans people's life expectancy is 35. And this is something that I, when I was coming up, I only came out at the age of uh, 30. And when I was looking this up in uh, India and our statistics here and the life expectancy, it was a huge factor. I'm like, I already lost all those other years and I've come to that, I've come to this uh, point where, you know, I'm getting to a point where that was something that affected my mental health for really long. This threat of violence that a few of us shared and then this, are we criminal? Are we not criminal? Uh, almost all of you uh, shared in this session something or the other about either living in a state that is still highly criminalized or living in a state that just got legal, which is something like I think for uh, Juan and for me and even for uh, Sarah for a little while and then went back. But we all live in this, which is very unique in Sarah's case because like it, 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 the Khwaja Sira were considered legal for a while, for a good amount of time and then went illegal. And we live in this duality of being legal and illegal, and it has a huge effect on our mental health. So one thing from everybody is we could see is the need for a lot more support with our mental health and sexual health, uh, something that I think we all agree on, uh, and we need a lot more support on, on programs like the one that uh, uh, Kevin mentioned about young, the Young and Health programs. We need uh, things like that happening a lot more for sure. Young and Alive, sorry. Young and Alive program, we need a lot more of those happening. So thank you, and passing it back to Sarah. Or actually, Julia. Yeah. Hello, Global Forum for Adolescents. My name is Julia Fan, and I work at Women Deliver, where I lead our work with adolescents and youth. And I'm excited to share with you all today a tool that I think will be really valuable for you in your work called Equitable Youth Engagement and Co-Leadership. Now, as we just heard from our incredible speakers, having adolescents and youth 
at the center of policies, programs, and initiatives, it's critical to ensuring that the outcomes of that program or policy are accomplished, but also that the program or policy really addresses the needs of adolescents and youth. So we developed this guide along with adolescents, youth, and other partners working with adolescents and youth earlier this year through a co-created approach. And I will jump right into what that approach is given I'm short on time. So this idea of equitable youth engagement and co-leadership is really meant to be a new way that we in our field can engage with adolescents and youth. That really is a transformative and intentional process by which power and decision-making is transferred to adolescents and youth alongside traditional power holders. This includes the power to create agendas, convene collective action and coalitions, um, and write new policies and programs, as well as research initiatives. Now, this approach wouldn't be possible without these three pillars that underline equitable youth engagement and co-leadership, and that's what really makes it equitable as well. So first is the need for technical and capacity support not only for adolescents and youth to ensure that they have the skills they need to thrive, but also for adult allies working with adolescents and youth, maybe for the first time in an initiative. We all have something to grow and learn in this partnership. Second, adolescents and youth need to be adequately and fairly compensated for their work, just as any other expert or leader or advocate would be. And third, we need to ensure an enabling and inclusive environment for adolescents and youth in these kinds of co-leadership and co-creator roles. So this includes ensuring robust safeguarding for adolescents and youth's mental, physical, and emotional health. It includes ensuring information is shared in a timely and youth-friendly way, and also includes ensuring that this process is in place and integrated at the outset of an initiative that's being designed. So the idea of having young people and adolescents uh, in co-leadership roles needs to be created from the very outset of an initiative. So I'll leave it here with that. Please check out the resource which will be shared on the platform after today's session. Thank you so much of an initiative. So I'll leave it here with that. Please check out the resource which will be shared on the platform after today's session. Thank you so much. Greetings. My name is Danette Wilkins, and I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I'm a program officer for sexual and reproductive health with Breakthrough Action, which is an eight-year cooperative agreement funded by the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, to lead its social and behavior change programming around the world. Breakthrough Action is a partnership led by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs in collaboration with Save the Children, Think Place, Ideas 42, Canberra Collective, International Center for Research on Women, and the AMO. For the first time, Breakthrough Action is working to identify and document what can and should be done to advance the inclusion of sexual and gender minority individuals in youth-focused family planning and reproductive health programming. In doing this work, we conducted a series of assessment activities, including a desk review, an online survey, a concurrent session at Women Delivered 2023, and most recently, a virtual learning series. Throughout all these assessment activities, we solicited the inputs and feedback of advocates, programmers, researchers, and others from around the world. Importantly, we've also worked closely with our partner, Young and Alive Initiative, to be able to not only design and implement the virtual learning series, but also to develop the Insights for Action Brief, which documents all the lessons that we've learned along the way. We are in the process of finalizing this brief and we look forward to sharing it with you all soon. This brief will be most useful to programmers who are focused on designing and implementing family planning and reproductive health programming with youth. However, it'll also be of interest and of use to others like researchers and advocates who want to be able to create more space to be able to develop and implement programming that's more affirming and inclusive of sexual and gender minority youth. This Insights for Action Brief will include a number of actions that can be taken by individuals, organizations, and programs to be able to further inclusion. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to connecting you with you all at a later date once this Insights for Action Brief is ready to be shared. Wishing you well.
Ser parte de la red jóvenes, conocer mis derechos sexuales y mis derechos reproductivos, empoderar a otros jóvenes para que vivan de forma segura e informada su sexualidad. Recordemos que la vida es una y es un carnaval. Yo soy muy barranquillero. Ser parte de la red jóvenes, vivir plenamente mi sexualidad. Saber qué puedo encontrar en otros jóvenes. Give a freedom for my sexuality where I can fight other youth that because those who live are those who use. They are seguro de crecimiento liderazgo. The youth network is a safe space for the defense and the sexual reproductive rights made by youth using creativity, power difference, empathy and love to empower other youth in lead, leading to this important transformation. I'm aware of my body. When do I, uh, where, when I respect the diversity? When do I have a, a reproductive right? When I take, uh, I know I use this space to share and learn with others, fostering autonomy and, and uh, comprehensive sexual education. Hola a todos. Somos Red Joven Hello, everyone. We believe and promote a safe environment when we promote safe information through art and culture. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending and participating in this session. And a special thanks to our speakers for their valuable uh, feedback and interventions and insights. And uh, I hope that all of you have gained something new to like resonate from your own uh, country to the different cultures. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session today.